Okay, this is the second lecture for the blood. And in the first lecture, we talked about the blood in general and talked about the plasma and its three components. And just by way of review, water is the majority of what is found in plasma, 90%. There is a protein component that is significant, and the proteins have osmotic roles to play as well as other purposes. And then we said that the small, tiny fraction of the plasma uh, are actually the dissolved substances. And uh, these are the reason for the cardiovascular system. Um, the transport and delivery of materials is these dissolved substances. And I, it's always amazing to me that these are such a tiny, tiny amount of the entire blood. And yet the blood is moving very quickly, so it's, even though it's transporting very little, uh, it's transporting it very quickly. And so, and transporting 24 hours a day. And so materials are constantly being delivered. But for this lecture, let's turn our attention to the formed elements. And there were three elements in the plasma. There are three formed elements in the blood. Um, and let's go through them real quick. The platelets um, are the um, are small fractional pieces of cells that are here. White blood cells, this is the only one of the three that are truly cells. These are truly cells in and of themselves. And then the red blood cells, and notice I put cells in parentheses. Technically, these are not cells. They're about the size of cells. Um, they're formed by cells, but they themselves do not fit the te technical definition for a cell. And commonly in medical work, you'll see WBC and RBCs as the abbreviation for white blood cells and red blood cells. So let's take each of these three uh, elements one at a time and decide uh, or in, and study and figure out what they're involved in. Let's start with the platelets. Okay, You can see that the platelets uh, are numbered in a sample of blood in the hundreds of thousands. That seems like, like a lot, but since they're just tiny fractional pieces um, of a cell, they're very, very small. There's lots of them, but they're tiny. Now, platelets are one of the elements that helps trigger blood clots. Um, when we talk about blood clotting in the human body, there are a number of different things that are involved in forming blood clots, but platelets have a role to play here. They are just, as I said before, just tiny bits of a larger cell. Picture a, a large cell that you see here, a megakaryocyte, and little bits of its cell membrane pooch out with a little cytoplasm. They pinch themselves off and become tiny little bits of a cell. They do contain um, a chemical component, and that is what triggers the blood clot. As long as the little platelets remain intact, um, there's not going to be any triggering of a blood clot. But if they're damaged, if they come apart and release that chemical, then a blood clot will begin to form. So chemicals associated with this begin to form those blood clots. And here you can see some little platelets, and you can see the beginnings of the form of the clot in and around those. The little fibers that are beginning to form are nearby these platelets. Um, and compare the size of the platelets to the size of that single red blood cell in the picture. And we spoke of one of the blood proteins before. What is happening here is this is the chemical reaction that changes the fibrinogen protein 
into its other form, which we call fibrin. It's actually the exact same protein. We call it fibrinogen in its liquid form, and we call it fibrin in its solid form. Now, the actual triggering of the blood clot from platelet is actually a fairly complicated process. In fact, when they pr platelets break open, they begin a chemical chain of events where the first chemical is released from the platelet, and that then triggers a chemical change in another one and another one. And little by little, like a row of dominoes, each chemical affects another one. And it's actually a 14-step process before you finally reach the point where fi fibrinogen changes into fibrin. Now, this makes it a fairly complicated process. And if anything were to go wrong in the midst of that, we could have a serious difficulty in the ability of the blood to clot. And this is the case in a disease called hemophilia. It disrupts the formation of fibrin. It's a genetic dis disease, and it's actually sex-linked, too. Now, we haven't discussed genetics before, but it is to say that it's um, found on the X chromosome and um, in a male who only has one X chromosome, if he has the hemophilic gene, then he has the disease. If he doesn't have it, then he doesn't. Girls are different. The females, since they have two X chromosomes, um, are only hemophilic if they were to have both Xs. And the chances of that happening are much, much less than it is for a male to have it. And uh, so it's a genetic disease. And typically, there are several forms of hemophilia. And typically, what happens is hemophilia knocks out or causes a malformation in one of these chemicals. Like here, I've just knocked out number five. So in a person that is starting to bleed, the platelets break open chemical sequence starts, it gets to number four, but because the number five is malformed, it never triggers number six, and so we never get to the place where fibrinogen is changed into fibrin. Um, in another form of hemophilia, it might be chemical number nine, but no matter what it is, these are disrupting the the formation of fibrinogen. So we want to remember that platelets trigger um, that change of fibrinogen into fibrin to help form blood clots. Okay, so that's platelets. The second component we were looking at are white blood cells. And they have two very important roles to play. What is interesting about white blood cells is there's five very distinct different types. And each one has a different role to play in the human body. Now, if I asked you what the two important roles are, you would tell me, I'm sure, number one, that they are the body defenses, um, that these fight disease and infection throughout your body. And that is absolutely right. They fight microorganisms. They defend you against invaders. If you were comparing this society of cells in my human body to our society, I would tell you that this is the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. These are the police and the sheriffs. These are the ones that keep order and take care of the bad guys. What's interesting is each one of these five has a very different role to play. And one of the more important tests that is done when somebody is sick is a blood cell count and one called a differential white cell count. Basically, it counts 
how many of each of the five are present. And there are normative numbers. And you can get right to the heart of a certain kind of infection or certain kind of disease when you see one of the five numbers very, very out of its normal range. If you see lots and lots of one of these cells, then you know you have a certain kind of problem versus when you have a lot of one of the others. You're going to do this when you get to physiology. You're going to learn the names of all five and you're going to count them um, in normal and abnormal populations and begin to see those relationships. When you get into a medical program, this is one of those things that becomes um, very, very important for a healthcare professional to know. Most people, though, right away don't know the second important role that white blood cells play in the human body, and that is as the janitorial crew. Um, some of the white blood cells have a very, very important role to play in cleaning up the human body. Any refuse, debris, especially um, when you have an infection and a war going on, say, between bacteria or viruses and cells. Um, as cells die, as bacteria die, um, as there's a lot of debris left over, there are white blood cells that come along and gobble all that up and digest it, just like a, um, a leukocyte. If you remember the leukocyte that we studied early on, I showed you that amazing picture of a white blood cell gobbling up bacteria. Well, same way that's gobbling up live bacteria, there are white blood cells that wander your body looking for dead, diseased, or dying materials. And, and even uh, apparently they can recognize cells that are beginning to become cancerous or beginning to wig out or do the wrong thing in the human body. And they will help to identify those and kill them, in fact. And, you know, anything that isn't doing what it's supposed to do in the human body is subject to these white blood cells. So these are, um, these are the one of the three that are truly cells. And you see nuclei in each one of these. Some of them have huge nuclei. Some of them have smaller nuclei. Many of them have those, those bulging nuclei where, where they're multi, uh, um, multi, multi poly, or polymorphonuclear leukocytes, right? Okay. So that's white blood cells. The third component are red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells, we, as we said before, are not really cells. Um, and just a, a quick little word about wells, where cells come from. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, all cells come from other cells. So there's a process of cell division um, where one cell grows. It Xeroxes its DNA or duplicates it. And then when the cell grows to a certain size, it divides itself into two lots, covers each one with a cell membrane. Each one gets the DNA so it can form a nucleus. And from one cell, you now have two cells. And every living cell in existence has been reproduced this way. Every bit of substance in the living world has been a multiplication process where one cell divides and produces two. Now, in the case of red blood cells, it's a slightly different process. In the, in the cells that produce red blood cells, we have a dividing process. But one cell remains like the original parent. The other cell does not get a nucleus. And so that's why we technically do not call it a cell. Um, the one with the nucleus hangs around in the red bone marrow of your bones and continues to produce these extra cells without a nucleus. 
that then drop into the bloodstream and become what we think of as red blood cells. Now, how many red blood cells are there? Um, I typically talk about this when we talk about, early on, the size of a capillary. But just a little reminder, remember you make a box, a cube, with its width, the thickness of a dime. That's a tiny little box. You fill it with blood, and in that box are 5 million red blood cells. So these are incredibly small. And this is how we measure all of those amounts of uh, each one of the three formed elements. In this sized box, it's five million red blood cells. There's several hundred thousand platelets. And there's somewhere between five and 10,000, just thousand white blood cells. So the white blood cells are few and far between um, on average. Now what we really want to do though is get to the fact of uh, what, what is the function? What, why are there so many red blood cells? Why are they here? And this is going to go right back to a moment when I talked about the plasma. Um, you remember that when we talked about plasma, that we said that the plasma carries all these substances dissolved in the water. Well, that works, but for one thing. There's one substance that is needed in such huge quantities that just the amount you can dissolve in the water of the plasma will not be enough to meet the needs of the human body. And that substance is oxygen. You can see what a central role over and over and over again oxygen plays in the cardiovascular system. The four-chambered heart is designed with that in mind. And, and the whole purpose of the circulating system is to send every single red blood cell to the lungs to pick up oxygen and then circulate those red blood cells out to the tissues. It is the only substance that is needed moment by moment in the human body and needed in huge, huge amounts. So picture red blood cells as little oxygen trucks. Their, their entire purpose is, or maybe like little sponges, their entire purpose is in the presence of oxygen, like you would find in the lungs, they soak up and, and hold on to oxygen. When those red blood cells circulate to a place where there's very little oxygen, as there would be in tissues that are rapidly using up oxygen, when those those, uh, those red blood cells get there, they release their oxygen. And that's, that's what makes them amazing, is that they have just this right ability to soak it up when there's a lot of it around and let go of it when there's very little around. Their, their grasp of the oxygen is very, very weak, but they hold on to it. Now, to understand the red blood cell a little bit better, we have to realize that there is a certain protein structure that is produced in red blood cells that is the actual carrier of the oxygen. Um, it's not just like a ribosome or an endoplasmic reticulum or something like that. No, red blood cells produce something called hemoglobin. Okay. And the amount of hemoglobin that's produced in a red blood cell is going to be its oxygen carrying capacity. Here is a, um, here is a hemoglobin molecule. It's actually four protein molecules uh, to, all together that produce this hemoglobin molecule. And the total amount of oxygen that blood can carry will be the amount of hemoglobin in any one red blood cell 
the total number of red blood cells and the shape of the red blood cell as well. So there's three things about the red blood cell that are very, very important to its ability to carry oxygen. Okay, so let's just deal with each of these one by one. Let's talk about the hemoglobin. Um, as I said before, it's four protein molecules functioning together. The uh, red blood cells uh, early on, before they divide, are manufacturing this hemoglobin. Remember that it's not the red blood cell, but the hemoglobin that is actually carrying the oxygen. The hemoglobin does require one very, very important element. The little blue dots that you see in the midst of those protein molecules are an element that is very, very important. And that element is called iron. If you look at the chemical diagram on your right, you can see all sorts of hydrocarbons, carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, surrounding a single element of iron. And that's what you see right there, right? Iron is critical. You cannot form hemoglobin without iron. And this is why it is so important to our diets and to our human bodies. Our bodies are actually very good at recycling the iron they already have. But no matter what you do, some of it is always going to be lost through your urine. So we do have to constantly um, add iron to our bodies. Um, we don't lose it very quickly, usually, but we do have to add some. Meats are very good. Uh, since meats typically have a lot of blood within them, um, even if they're drained of blood, they're going to have um, lots of iron. Dark green leafy vegetables. Uh, the king of the dark green leafy vegetables is spinach. Um, some people don't like spinach because it can actually have sort of a sharp metallic taste, especially when it's rich, rich in iron. Uh, you want good iron in your diet? Have a spinach salad or cook some up for dinner sometime. A um, lot of foods that we buy packaged are enriched with iron, like most uh, um, flour-type products, like breads and, and cakes and things like that. And there's some uh, fruit and uh, nut sources that are rich in iron. And anytime you're concerned about a nutrient, you can always go online and look up what kinds of foods you find that are rich in these products. So very, very important that iron is in this. Now, how, how is iron and how is hemoglobin related to this? Well, it's so, so interesting um, because in the same way that iron in our natural world rusts, it's actually the same kind of activity that is going on when hemoglobin catches and holds on to oxygen. I don't know if you know um, rust, but hemoglobin literally rusts. When, when we say something rusts, we're really saying that it oxidizes. If you look at the rust on some metal, rust is iron oxide. It's iron bound to some oxygen molecules, and it forms this crusty reddish-brown stuff. Well, in the bloodstream, when oxygen binds to the heme and the hemoglobin, we get this bright red color. And so blood that is oxygenated is bright red, and blood that is not oxygenated is a very dull, dull sort of maroon or purple color. We've always been able to test this by just checking the redness of the blood. Um, Back when we were doing live blood tests in our physiology class, students would prick their finger. We'd put a drop of their blood on a white, white, white piece of paper. 
And if you can see that little chart over there, you could hold that that color of blood on the paper behind each one of those empty circles. And that would put the color of the blood right next to those different shades of blood. And you could check to see how much hemoglobin <coughs> was in your blood literally by checking its color. Today we have machines that will do this for us. Okay, and uh, so they will they will test and tell us, and, and they do this in blood tests too. If you're going to donate blood, um, before you're going to donate blood, they want to make sure that your blood doesn't have too little iron or too little hemoglobin in it. And it's it's a very interesting test. They used to do this color test. Today they'll have a little vial of fluid that's colored blue. And it's got a density of a chemical called copper sulfate in it. And uh, literally, you take a drop of blood, you drop it in that vial. And if the density of your blood is lighter, if there isn't as much iron in it, it will be lighter or weigh less than the fluid there. And the little drop of blood will float. If it's got enough iron in it, it will sink. And so all you have to do is look. If the blood sinks, then your blood is okay for donation. It's rich in hemoglobin. So all of this relates to oxygen carrying capacity. Let's turn our attention to a moment to a disease called anemia. You maybe have heard of people being anemic. Uh, it's a very simple disease. It is simply a lack of oxygen delivery to your tissues. Um, oxygen should enter the respiratory system from the atmosphere and be drawn by the respiratory system into the bloodstream. Cardiovascular system with the blood that is rich in oxygen then delivers that to the cells and tissues of the human body. Anything that interrupts that right from the ability of the oxygen to get into the blood to something about the cardi cardiovascular system that doesn't deliver enough oxygen can cause anemia out in the cells. So simply anemia is a lack of oxygen at the tissue level. And it's directly related to the red blood cells. Okay, some sort of decreased oxygen delivery. Now, get several causes, and that's why we're going into these three different characteristics of the red blood cell, because each influences that. Each influences the, um, the delivery of oxygen. What are some symptoms? Let's just kind of finish this up. What are symptoms of anemia? A person is very tired, feel run down, listless. Just, boy, you, you know, you've lived most of your life with a lot of energy. All of a sudden, you're just overly tired. There's something wrong. And so this can be caused by too little hemoglobin in the cells. We can do a color comparison for that. It could be caused, too, by maybe you just don't have enough red blood cells. That uh, hematocrit test that we talked about is central here. If we did a hematocrit and your hematocrit was 37 instead of 45, well, you're just not delivering enough oxygen to your tissues. So too few numbers of red blood cells is a form of anemia. Okay, and it's going to seriously affect um, your delivery of oxygen. The third element that affects the delivery of oxygen is the shape of the red blood cell. It's very interesting that the red blood cell is perfectly designed or engineered to do what it does. Now, do you know what the shape of the red blood cell is? Have you noticed that? It, it has um, a maximum surface area 
And this is if you're going to if you are going to design the perfect red blood cell, you would want it to have the maximum surface area because obviously oxygen floating around is going to encounter the surface of the red blood cell first. It's going to be soaked up from the surface. So I want an object as a red blood cell that has lots and lots of surface area. That's going to have contact with the red with the the oxygen. Now a ball is typically that shape. A ball is an object that has um, a maximum amount of surface area with a minimum amount of volume. In other words, we want lots of surface, but we don't need a lot of guts. We don't need a lot of inside. If there's too much inside, then it'll take up too much space. Since the oxygen only attaches at the surface, we don't need a lot of inside. So how do we take a ball and make it smaller? Well, we pinch it. Take it and pinch it and make it into more of a disk. We leave the curves on it, though. See how the curves now go inward instead of outward. Okay. And this shape now defines the perfectly engineered device. It has huge surface area with a small amount of volume. You may recognize that this looks sort of like a lifesaver or a breath mint or a throat, throat lozenge. Um, companies have taken this up because they can put the least amount of stuff with the most amount of surface area. So the thing dissolves very quickly. It gives off lots of particle from its large surface area, but it doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. Okay, so uh, also this round, round, smooth shape slips through the blood vessels very nicely, especially the capillaries. So this shape is very, very important to oxygen carrying. Now there's a form of anemia, we've been talking about anemia, that alters the shape of the red blood cell. Maybe you've heard of it. Sickle cell anemia is a problem, it's an anemic situation, it's a problem in the shape of the red blood cell. This is what a normal red blood cell looks like, the ones you see here. This is the shape of a sickle cell. And uh, here is any number of cells with misshapen forms. It's a genetic disease. You can't catch this. Something is wrong in the genes that tell your body how to make its parts. And because there's a mistake in the genetic code here, it tells red blood cells to make themselves in these odd, odd shapes. Okay, so um, the big, big problem here is not only do you have this maximum surface area, but these cells are more likely to get caught in blood vessels. They're more likely to bunch up and create places where blood can't flow through. These blood clots then reduce the amount of blood flowing into a tissue. A reduction of blood means less oxygen, and so tissues all throughout the human body begin to starve for oxygen. So the shape of the cell, the surface of the cell can't carry as much oxygen, and the shape of the cell gets plugged in capillaries. Makes for, when, when tissues uh, lack oxygen, especially the nerve, any nerve cells that may be in those tissues begin to send pain signals. This can be a fairly painful disease. So, anemias are all related to the qualities of the red blood cell. Quantity of hemoglobin, 
is the amount of oxygen any red blood one red blood cell can carry the total number of red blood cells and of course the shape of the red blood cell all three of these are critical to the amount of oxygen that can be carried and a problem in any one of these means a lack of oxygen to the tissues so red blood cells very very important um, in our cardiovascular system so that that is everything here right when you look at this picture you look at that first tube and you should see plasma and formed elements those numbers you should remember you should remember that that um, the formed elements are less than half and usually 45 55 is is a good figure to keep in mind the other numbers here I'm not uh, so um, insistent on remember the plasma has its three elements you should know what the proteins uh, are for and do you should know the solutes that are dissolved in the water you should know the three formed elements and the role that each plays in the human body and there you have it that is the blood